Oh no, you do you. You beat that dog. Hi, I'm Rodney. I'm Alexis. And, and this, this is The, the Vegan, Vegan Agenda. Agenda. In response to the Why I Am No Longer Vegan videos that have been trending, we've decided to make a collection of interviews with everyday vegans who have made an ethical connection and have chosen not to use animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. Veganism is not just a diet, it's a lifestyle based on an intention to minimize the suffering and exploitation of animals. If you find this video informative, interesting, enjoyable, or helpful, please like, subscribe, and share. My name is Dr. Susan Elizondo. Um, and I live in Austin, Texas. I think that my official decision to go ethically vegan will be, it was as of May 15th, 2016, because I ate a cupcake at a wedding and I decided it didn't taste good enough <laughs> for all the pain and suffering that went into it. And so after that, I didn't eat any more animal products. I was actually a pretty hardcore meat eater, carnivore, thought vegans were crazy before that. <laughs> so I originally started out where, um, it all started because I had to go to the bathroom one day, and I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I, I <heard> it. <laughs> and I was walking around Town Lake, and I abhor porta potties. So we found Casa de Luz, and they have a free public bathroom outside. And I felt guilty for using their bathroom and not eating at their restaurant. So we came back later and actually ate dinner there with me and my boyfriend, who's now my husband. Um, and I thought the food was great, and I had never felt so good. And it's a restaurant that's vegan, gluten-free, oil-free, and they had some um, kind of paraphernalia up there for uh, kind of vegan interests and different things, and so it started me a little bit down the rabbit hole of documentaries with Forks Over Knives and Vegucated, and, and then eventually, I, I started doing it for health reasons, but eventually as you look into it more and more, you find all the ethical reasons behind it as well. And so I finally got to a point where I didn't feel that I could eat those items without, I didn't see any point in eating them anymore because there was, there was no good reason to when I had other options. And also I found like when you eat really cleanly and then you go back and you eat like pork or seafood or something like that, you feel crummy <laughs> for days afterwards. And so it's like you feel great and then you eat something that's not great for you. And so you feel physically bad and then you feel emotionally bad because there was some poor chicken that was ground up in a grinder that didn't have to die when you had another easy alternative. It's just me and my husband in the household and he actually, he went vegan a few months after me. Um, and since I usually do all the cooking when we were together, I actually didn't realize he had gone vegan for several months. So then I heard him telling people he was vegan and I was like, <laughs> I was like, are you vegan? He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, when did that happen? We do mainly um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. So. Kind of a typical meal would be like rice and beans with some sort of vegetable and a lot of times I'll put salad on top of it or you can make like a like a, a bootable type of thing so still the rice beans with seasoning salad guacamole and so i eat mostly unprocessed which are rice and beans and they're the cheapest things in the grocery store potatoes um, vegetables when we do it if you do the kind of processed items like the fake meats and specialty vegan items, then it can get a bit more expensive. Um, but for the most part, we stay towards the, the whole food side of things. I originally started from the health side of things. Um, and then there's, once you get into it more, you find the ethical side of things and the environmental side of things. Um, and I feel like if I'm ever having a conversation about veganism, a lot of people will argue the health points and there's research back and forth and you can argue the environmental points and everybody will have like, well, this study and that study, but it's really hard to argue against the ethical side. It's like, look, there's almond milk at, you know, in the store, nobody was harmed. There's like cow milk in there. And especially being an expectant mom, like you think about it more and more. Like if, if you're drinking that baby's milk, what's the baby drinking? The more I think about it, the sadder it makes me. Cause I think, what would I do if somebody, like somebody took my baby and instead of them getting to have my breast milk, I was just enslaved and somebody was just treating me cruelly and taking all my breast milk and then they either killed my baby or sent them off to slaughter or, you know, it's, it's really hard to think of because we, like, we treasure our kids, but somehow there's that disconnect between the dairy industry and how all of those females have to be pregnant to produce milk and, like, what happens to the baby. It has come up with my family. It's been like, are you sure, you know, you're going to gain enough weight or eat enough? And... 
you know, I had blood work done and my blood work looks great because I eat whole food plant-based. I have a lot of fiber in my diet because one of the common complaints during pregnancy is constipation. Um, never been an issue. <laughs> um, all my blood work looked great. And if you're eating a balanced diet, you can get all the nutrients that you need. So far, my baby is growing on track, is actually a little bit bigger than average. So he's very active. He's kicking me on the way over here. So, oh, <laughs> so he's doing good. And I think it's usually just, you know, taking the time to be like, well, think about the things that they tell you not to eat during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. What category do they always fall into? It's pork, it's eggs, it's seafood. And you can also think of it as like, well, if you shouldn't eat those when you're pregnant because they're bad for you, why would you be eating them at other times as well? Well, I actually get this question a lot with um, patients because um, I'm actually an optometrist and I do talk to patients quite a bit about um, eating healthier in a whole food plant-based diet. And a lot of times they'll ask me, are you asking me to be vegan? And I say, no, I'm asking you to limit the amount of kind of animal products in your diet because vegan I feel is an ethical choice so it's not just what's on your plate it's kind of what you're wearing things like that people don't think about like leather a lot of products you, you probably don't even think about soap shampoo um, honey is one that's missed a lot um, and then there's as far as just things in your day-to-day -day life and then there is like going to a zoo or supporting anything that exploits animals in any way, like SeaWorld or horse racing or things of that nature. I was in uh, Hawaii with friends and they all went to a seahorse aquarium. And I was like, oh, they're like, oh, well, it's, it's great because it's for, you know, they breed the seahorses, so there'll be more of them and it, it does great things for them. And I was like, oh, so it's seahorses that have been injured <laughs> and they return them to the wild they were <laughs> they're like oh no they just they they breed them in the tank so people can see them and be exposed to them and I was like oh so they just breed them for our pleasure and they have to stay in a tank instead of a huge vast ocean to live their lives out and so there are you know some choices that we make especially when we go on vacation like of activities that a lot of times people don't think of that exploit animals you know, I went on vacation in Thailand and I I, before I was vegan and I rode an elephant and I was like, oh, but this is a, a conservation place and oh, they tell me they, they're gentle with their elephants and that that hook doesn't hurt them and that, you know, they tell you all these things that if you don't look into it and you just listen to what they're telling you, it seems, it seems okay. <laughs> but really it's a creature that could be roaming free and instead has a seat strapped on top of it and is taking people around the same track all day long and if they don't do what they're supposed to they get hit with a hook or they get beaten or they get tortured and they have to entertain people for food and it's like if you were a person that wouldn't be an acceptable life and I think a lot of times before you get into the side where you're really looking at like it's it almost sounds like it's a huge conspiracy theory <laughs> until you start looking into it because when you're on the other side of things, they tell you things like, oh, the animal likes it. Oh, their skin is really thick. They don't feel pain. Oh, it's not. There are all these excuses that you can find that will make you think, oh, it's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, and, and if you don't really want to look into it, it's easy to not see what you don't want to see. You have to get a little bit more adventurous because if you want to see animals like now we drop into the ocean and wait for the pot of dolphins to swim by like the last time we went to Hawaii or we go um, we go scuba diving and go into that natural environment and see them as they are and you don't touch and you don't do anything but you have to kind of take the extra effort to to get out there and see them but we've definitely we've been to we've been to Morocco we've been to Portugal we've been to Hawaii We've been all around Costa Rica and had amazing vacations there that involve animals, just not exploiting them. Vegans, I just didn't understand the concept. It was just too far out there. Vegetarianism, I was like, okay, I kind of get what they're doing. Don't totally understand it. But I, I told my um, boyfriend, now husband at the time, that because I knew he had dated a vegetarian before me, that if he ever went vegetarian, I would break up with him because wow. it would just be too different and we wouldn't get to share the same things and life would be just so different, like it wouldn't work out. Before, you know, you see all the advertising, you grew up in a family that cooks for you a certain way and especially being Mexican, like, you know, we ate rice and beans and the rice had chicken stock, the bean was made with salt pork, you had lard, 
Like there's a lot of lard <laughs> in Mexican cooking and there's fajitas and tacos and I didn't really see vegetables growing up unless they were the little bit of cilantro on top of things. So it was just a whole new awakening to discover, oh, you can be healthy if you don't eat these things. And not only can you be healthy, you can be healthier by not eating the other stuff, by eating the meat and pork and dairy and eggs, than if you were. It was actually Forks Over Knives, the documentary. And I come from a science research background. Um, I actually have a master's in molecular and cellular biology. So I, um, so I, I actually looked up research papers um, and I read the research myself because it's one thing to read an article or hear somebody spouting about it on TV or in a documentary and you're like, you know, well, is that correct? Anybody can say what they want, right? <laughs> but if you actually, actually go back and read the research papers, then you kind of see where the numbers come from and what they were doing and, and how they got to the point where they were. You know, you can manipulate a study if you want to. You can make it so that, okay, these people ate tons of eggs a day and their cholesterol didn't go up, but you were comparing to a group of people that ate, ate egg McMuffins or mixed sausage sandwiches or something like that. Our insurance keeps going up, right? <laughs> because if you have people that are chronically ill, then it's it costs a lot to take care of them for the doctor's visits and the medications and all the treatments that they need. And I was, I was kind of irritated that as somebody that had no health conditions, my premiums were jumping um, to more than two and a half times as much when I was getting the same amount of care. And so since I am in the healthcare industry, I discovered that, well, if this is something that can reverse chronic diseases, that can help us health-wise with our health, health crisis as a country, then I'm in a position to talk to people about it. And that's actually why I bought my own business was so that I could talk about it with nobody telling me not to. It's actually a vegan company. That's amazing. And it's in the employee manual. Um, I did have somebody quit because of that. I hire everybody. Okay. Um, they can eat what they want, but if there is a meal that's provided by the company, then it's vegan. I am one of the co-leaders of a group that pro promotes whole food plant-based eating. It's ATX Alive. I run the website and the newsletter, and I do local restaurant events. Restaurants don't care what you eat as long as you're going to pay them money if they make it for you. I have to go to a lot of meetings for continuing education and other things um, where I can't control the restaurant, I can't control where we eat, but I, I always ask for a vegan and oil-free meal and I always get it. I think sometimes people think of it as, oh, I don't wanna be a problem at the restaurant. I'm the customer, I'm asking for something and you can provide me with what I ask for or you can lose out on my business. Usually I'm, I'm pretty upfront about it and I'll actually, it makes the staff of the um, restaurant feel better if you just kind of say, I know I'm going to be the problem child. I'm so sorry. I'll go last. Let me ask you questions. And you're like, I'm, and if you make it like, you understand it's an inconvenience for them. You understand it's different and you tip well. Thus far, I've never found a place that could not accommodate me. I think one of the important things when you start out too, is you have to be consistent because if somebody's like, oh, well, it's a special occasion, just have this. If you keep doing that, then you're not setting consistent boundaries that they understand because it's like, well, the next time, why would you take it if you, I mean, why wouldn't you take it? You took it before. They always want to accommodate you. So I'm, you know, I never make a big deal out, out of it. If they don't have something that I can have, I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I just, you know, I'll bring my own or I just won't eat. Don't worry about mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. But people are really nice and they usually want to accommodate you. And if they see you, they were sitting, not eating. They, <laughs> like, they, they, I find people go out of their way to like, bring me fruit or bring me just like anything Aww, to help me out. So that's people awesome. have been pretty supportive. I think I'm pretty stubborn. So I don't, and everybody has to find things out differently. And so I feel like the way that I found it out, I took my time, I researched it, I did it slowly. That if somebody had just come to me and told me, oh, be vegan for all these reasons, even if it was myself, probably, I wouldn't have listened to them. Like, <laughs> to be quite honest. I don't know that I was in a place before where I could have kind of been able to keep up and, and maintain like this lifestyle that, that I was, because you have to be willing to change. You have to be in a place where you're willing to change some things in your life. I've always been a chubby kid. <laughs> I mean, it would have been nice to know this before, and so I wouldn't have been the like always chunky child that was, when I was taken to the doctor, the doctor would always have that secret conversation with my mom about how your kid is fat. <laughs> It's frustrating because things are the way they are because that's how your family has done it before or because, but there's no reason that it has to be that way, mm -hmm. you know? 
So it's kind of frustrating. It's like, well, why doesn't everybody eat like me? Because <laughs> this is healthier for you. And when I started down this path, I, you know, I exercised seven days a week. I was in a normal weight category, but my cholesterol was fairly high. Um, and I was only 34. And I, and it was after already starting to do plant-based when I had it checked. And so I don't know what it was before then. Um, and I remember when they told me, I was like, this can't be right. I don't think you understand. <laughs> I've been cutting down the amount of meat that I have in my diet. After I found out it was high, I was like, okay, I'll do this a little bit more seriously. And I cut out pretty much all animal products at that point. I found that out myself because the, um, the cholesterol check was actually just a fluke. I was on vacation and my boyfriend's flight was delayed and they had a health fair in the airport. And so to kill time, I just went over and had my blood check. And then two months later, my cholesterol had dropped 40 points. It was definitely a wake up call because my dad had a triple heart bypass at 60 with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, eight stints put in. Uh, my grandfather died of a heart attack at 50. Um, my on his side, the grandfather on my mother's side um, passed away from complications with diabetes. The grandmother on my father's side also passed away <laughs> with complications from diabetes. Um, so I knew what would happen if I didn't change things. So it dropped my cholesterol. Other things that I didn't expect was uh, my blood pressure was actually pretty normal. It was like 120 over 80, but now it typically runs 90 and over 60 range. There are all these little things that you think are just normal and just you. <laughs> uh, my feet stop stinking. <laughs> um, and I have a lot more energy because I was always really tired. I would always sleep a ton. And now even pregnant, I have more energy than I did before I went vegan. And I was, I was actually running up until like six or seven weeks pregnant. It dropped quite a bit of weight. Of course, I'm, I'm pregnant now. So I, I have gained the weight back, but I lost about 20 pounds when I initially um, switched over. And it's just been nice because it's kind of like your your ethics align with your way of life. And I don't know, it gives, it's a nice peace of mind as far as value systems go. Got rid of the redness in my cheeks. When you don't eat a lot of fiber, you don't go to the bathroom as often. <laughs> and so oh, right. I used to go maybe uh, once or twice a week and now I'm fairly regular. So that was also, it's, it's a very nice feeling. I think it's a little frustrating because there is definitely a difference between just being plant-based and being vegan, and I think vegan is an ethical choice, and so I don't know how you can go from saying that it's not okay to, like, say, kill a fish and pill or catch a fish and pull its skin off while it's still alive to, like, oh, it's okay, I need the omega-3s from it, especially when there are other plant sources of that. There's, there's always an alternative. It may take research, it may take other things to figure it out, but there's always an alternative. Um, so it doesn't have to happen, and I just don't understand how, because I know other people like in my life as well, where they're like, yeah, I tried it for a little bit, and it didn't work out. And I was like, well, did you just not eat animal products, or did you actually look into the ethical side of things? And I don't understand how, like, now you're okay with, like, chickens in cages, and cows being shot in the head, and, like, stealing babies, and... <laughs> I know it sounds like judgmental, but I think it's the excuse from peer pressure because, you know, I'm, I tend to be a, a pretty stubborn, ornery person and not everybody is like that. <laughs> um, and I get it when, you know, cause sometimes family members, especially when you don't see them all the time, it's one thing to be around people day to day and they know how you live and they understand how you eat. But then you go to grandma's house and like, oh, you're the horrible person turning down her tamales. Oh, you're the person that won't eat grandma's beans that she made just for you. And a grandma doesn't understand, like, why, or Aunt, you know, Mary, or whatever, doesn't understand why. And so there's that pressure. So it's kind of easier, I think it's kind of easier to convince yourself that it's okay, so that you're not disappointing the people around you, in their eyes you're not disappointing them, than it is to kind of stick to your gun sometimes. So I think there's definitely a lot of social pressure that, that kind of plays into it. I think you kind of have to present it to them, but understand that they are their own person that makes their own decisions, and you can't choose what they get to do, even if you know that it's detrimental to them. You can't, you can't make them do what you want them to, no matter how great you think it is for them. And so there has to be a point where you say, you know, and especially looking back at how I was, <laughs> you know, and how much I've changed, I, you know, I can understand 
how it's difficult that for them to see my perspective. Um, cause with my, with my father, I, I actually, there's the, uh, the Montgomery health and wellness center in Houston. Mm -hmm. And I actually offered to pay for him to go through the program, um, and his spouse, um, and uh, he declined because he didn't want to. What kind of program is that? Um, they essentially go over all the health aspects of eating kind of whole food, plant-based, and reversing heart disease, and they kind of treat you at the facility and to try and make it more successful. And then you can bring your spouse, too, because it helps if everybody's on board. He knows the way I eat. He knows what my that my cholesterol has gone down, and essentially he's... You know, he's chosen not to do it. He's He said it was like Nutrisystem, and I'm like, it is not like Nutrisystem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you try and re-explain things, but there's, you know, there's only so much you can do. You can you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So you just have to be your own person and set a good example. And sometimes people will surprise you. Like my, my aunt actually um, happened to be visiting me when I was going to a potluck to hear a speaker um, talk about healthy living. And she is not 100% vegan, is not 100% plant-based, but she switched her diet enough to be off of her blood pressure medication because she was on four. They were trying to put on her fifth one, but the side effects were too bad, and now she's on no blood pressure medication. She's on no diabetes medication. Um, she can walk further than she has in the past. You always bring it up because everybody has different things that are important to them, right? Um, if somebody's in their 20s, has no health issues, they're not going to be really into the health aspect of it. <laughs> But maybe they're an animal lover. Maybe they're really conscious about the environment. Or maybe they are part of the LBGT community. And you can see how, like, because there is this, you know, in these animal industries who generally gets to be caged and mistreated for the use of their private parts. It's the female sex because um, they have babies and they produce milk. And so um, it's kind of just trying to equate it to inequalities, you know, mm -hmm. trying to kind of bring it across like human animal lines. There are some times where it's like, you know, you can tell a person isn't ready. They know how you are, they know how you eat, and you kind of, you you say your your comments when, when you can. And, and by comments, I don't mean like, oh, you eat that hamburger, you're gonna die. It's like, if they complain they're constipated, you say, you know, you could eat more fiber and you get that from <laughs> fruits and vegetables. <laughs> so try to always approach it in the positive way because a lot of times it's seen as like, judgmental vegans like trying to tell everybody how it's done and how it's supposed to be I feel like almost in that way anytime you're with somebody you have to be like not only nice compassionate in the animal sense but it's made me nicer in the human sense um, with other people and just my interactions with them because I know there is you know I'm telling somebody be compassionate towards animals see their side of things try and understand and then if I'm over here being judgmental and not understanding anything from their point of view that that doesn't help at all it was definitely an overtime thing because when I first went vegan I was just like everybody should do this <laughs> let me shout it from the rooftops I've been to a cube of truth before and I um, talked to patients about it but it was more around like people that I was with and and like every patient that I saw I was like pushing it you know and it's really you have to kind of like choose what you say and how to approach people um and I actually have a friend who, I don't know how she does it, but if she enters into a conversation with somebody, like I come back and she knows their life story and she's talking to them about plant-based eating. And like, I don't know how she does it. <laughs> she does wonders. But I've tried to be kind of more like, more like that in that, you know, you try and kind of listen to the other person and their concerns and their interests. And then you broach it from like what way would be most, mean the most to them. Well, I heard it described like in a really good way once where it's like nobody thinks it's okay to beat a dog, right? And if you knew somebody was being a dog, would you just walk by and let them do their own thing? Or would you say, hey, this is happening. Don't beat your dog. <laughs> and I feel like vegans are the people that see that something horrible is happening and it's hard to just stand by and watch it happen and be like, oh no, you do you. You beat that dog. Like it's good. Like it, it's hard to do that. It's kind of like even though it's uncomfortable, it's standing up for something that you feel is you feel is right, um, and that pretty much everybody does. It's just sometimes they're not aware of it. Before I was I was a big foodie, and and I still am, and I just now cook a lot of my own food. Coming from Mexican background, I always like the rice and beans, but I have a sweet tooth as well, 
And so I bake a lot, actually. I bake chocolate cake with chocolate frosting, vanilla frosting, and, you know, and I take it in, and I take it into work, and everybody loves it. And when I take my food in, it's, it's, all, it's all about the spices. That's what makes it taste good. I used to do the Fort Sober Knives website, Casa de Luz cookbook, Oh, She Glows. You can always modify those. With two of us in the house, like, my husband's, like, six feet tall and does bodybuilding. He's vegan as well. But it's, he eats way more than I do, so we try and do the meal plan. <laughs> I like Mike the Vegan, um, that vegan couple. I also, especially when I first started, I really like Joey Carbstrong, um, just because he goes out a lot and he talks to the public, and he manages to talk to people about really heated topics without really getting into fights. <laughs> I also like um, Dr. McDougall, because for more the like health science side, he does like YouTube um, videos like once a week with somebody that's asking him different health questions. There's no downside because when you look at the the animal wealth or animal ethics side of it, like there are alternatives, especially where we live, that where you don't have to choose something that will torture and kill an animal. As a lot of times people will argue for humane meat and it's like, well, if you had a four-year-old that you raised really well and was super happy, would you be okay with killing it? And like, and then selling its, its parts for me. And there's also the human welfare side of it because I think a lot of times people forget when somebody has to work in these factories, somebody has to slaughter these animals and be in these horrible conditions to do it. And then these factories have to exist somewhere. And so they're usually they're in more rural areas with poor communities where the people around them are exposed to the fecal waste that we don't know where it goes and it causes health problems in the local communities uh, that these companies don't pay for. These companies, they have because, you know, we poop, animals poop. There's a lot of waste. It's not treated. When it rains, you get run off into the local streams. So on the environmental side, it kills the local wildlife. It pollutes the streams of these areas and communities. These companies are not paying to clean it up, and it eventually runs off into the ocean. You can get dead zones. And so there's the environmental aspect of it as well. Sometimes people will argue, well, we're bringing business to other countries. If you look at it, we're chopping down a rainforest. We're giving animals a place to graze. And then the grazing doesn't last for very long, so then we leave and we have just devastated their environment in that area. And they have to try and figure out something to do now that the big company has gone and decided they're not useful for, to them anymore. Mm -hmm. When I was in Costa Rica, we were driving through an area that should have all been forest, and there was just graze land like all around there. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that they had mentioned was that they had originally cut down all this area because they were supposed to get a big agricultural contract and then it fell through. So now they have this like devastated area that they're not able to use and really make a lot of profit on. So they, they turned back to ecotourism um, actually to try and help the country out. And, and on the environmental side as well, it's, you know, these are, there are tons and tons of animals and they all produce waste and not just waste that goes into the ground, waste that goes into the air. And then on the health side of things, a lot of times primary care physicians won't talk to their patients about changing their diet because it's a long conversation and you don't really get reimbursed for it. Um, but in patients I've asked, I was like, have, has anybody talked to you about your diet? Has anybody told you that diabetes and high blood pressure are reversible? Has anybody said this to you? And a lot of times they'll say no. And so for patients, sometimes they reach a point where it's like, I wouldn't mind, you know, even if they don't go 100% vegan, like there's still, it's still worth it for that person to go from eating 200 pounds of meat to eating like five pounds of meat. It still makes a difference. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Like if they're willing to change a little bit, I find a lot of times when you learn about the health side, you learn about the other aspects of it too. And eventually you kind of taper off your animal product consumption. I think one person definitely can, because especially with social media, you don't realize like everybody that sees your feed or hears you or knows what you're doing. Um, Cause there've been times where I've been really sad. Cause I feel like somebody who was my friend who decided to go vegan and I was so excited and then they weren't, they didn't go all the way vegan. And I was like, Oh, well that they went back to kind of the way they were before. And I was like, Oh, well, okay. And then you find out somebody will, I am you from out of the blue, which I have had happen. They're like, Hey, I saw your feed. It's cool. It's got like, great food photos posted, I decided to go um, plant-based, we're trying to go vegan, and it just kind of renews you, because as long as you just do you and set a good example, like, people people notice, and they'll notice it if you're positive about it, 
If you're negative about it, that just really turns people off. It's a lifestyle choice and it's a lifetime change. It doesn't have to be done overnight. If you're unsure how this is going to work for you, don't just not do anything. Start with the little things like, oh, I know that when I make my beans, I can take the salt fork out. You know, I know when I make my rice, I can use vegetable broth, broth instead of chicken. And maybe start with food first, because usually that's the easiest one for people. And then don't just not do anything else, because it, it took me a while, even after I switched, because I wasn't aware of, like, animal products and shampoos and conditioners and, like, Actually, just recently, I discovered nail polish <laughs> is usually not vegan. My husband's sister, who's not vegan, told me. She's like, oh, I got this vegan nail polish. What do you mean? I was like, nail polish isn't vegan? <laughs> Good to know. So just take it little by little, and if you keep taking little steps in the right direction, you'll eventually get there. If you try and do it all at once, it just seems so overwhelming. My closest friends are vegan, um, and it, you know, you just find that you start to hang out with people that share similar interests and values for you and you tend to have deeper relationships with those people because they really understand your core values. Um, as I still have friends, I, I swing dance as well. Um, and we travel for that and have a lot of friends in that community. And I still do it, even normal. six months pregnant. I typically find that, you know, if you were close and you had a really good relationship with somebody and they knew who you were as a person, they'll accept you whether you're vegan or not. Typically, the people that have a harder time with it are people that you really didn't connect with all that well to begin with. My my mom and my sister are certainly not vegan, but they my mom is awesome when she comes to town. She knows that my my apartment is a vegan apartment, no animal products allowed in there, and she'll eat vegan for the whole weekend. And I try and make it as appealing as possible. So if somebody is willing to go out to a vegan restaurant with me, I pay for them. <laughs> now, if you liked it, you got a great tasting free meal. If you didn't, it was a free meal. <laughs> um, and when I go visit somewhere else, because I do also do the no oil thing, I'll go to the grocery store. I buy the groceries. I go. I cook for them. I serve them. I do all the dishes afterwards. And that's what I typically do for my sister. And when you have three kids in no time, it's great, and the food tastes good, and so nobody has a, a problem with it. I'll tell people sometimes if they want to meet, and it's to make it easier, I'll be like, I just want to hang out with you. I just want to talk to you. Like, I don't care where we go. We could just go and have tea. Tea is usually vegan. <laughs> so, <laughs> as long as you don't put the milk in it. My business is Westlake Hills Vision Center. It's in Austin. Um, that has westlakehillsvision.com is our website, and then... I also run ATX Alive, which is a local plant-based group, um, and that's atxalive.com and ATX Alive on Facebook as well, um, and ATX Alive on Instagram. <laughs> yes. all this. Thank you for sharing this information and your, Thanks your for time having with me. us. We really yeah. appreciate you. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to be interviewed, please visit The Vegan Agenda on Facebook. Look for The Flying Pig. We will be featuring more interesting and inspiring vegans, so be sure to like, subscribe, and click that bell for notifications. If you want to help us promote veganism, please support The Vegan Agenda on Patreon. We would love to hear from you. Please comment below to let us know your thoughts. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching. dance as well. Sorry, I just from. pictured you swim dancing <laughs> with that little belly and your cute shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I still I do it, normal. even six months pregnant.